Okay, I think we're ready here. We've started. This is National Master Dennis Montecrucis, and today we're going to take a look at one of my very old games back from 1986, and this was played against Philip Cobert, who was a strong expert at the time. I had played him three years before when he was a master, and uh, fortunately I was successful in both games. So this is, um, this is from the Greater Western Open, which is nowadays a, a pretty major tournament in the American um, Swiss calendar. And it also doubled as the uh, the state championship at the time. So uh, I was able to win the state championship three years in a row, but I, I won this tournament once. So, you know, at least I, I have that on my on my resume, though admittedly it was before it became really uh, the massive event it is today. But still I had some nice results there way back when as a, as a relative youngster. Okay, so I had white in this game. And... Um, what I want to say about this game is that it's, uh, it was one of my favorites at the time, so I was very happy with this, played in, in I think, a good positional style, and, and won fairly smoothly. So we'll see, there's some other points that I want to make about this game too, but um, let's take a look at, at the, uh, the actual play, and we'll, we'll worry about lessons and uh, morals of the story and such later on. Okay, so here we go, I started off d4, knight f6, c4, and my opponent played a king's Indian defense here. And I went in for the classical. And here he played kind of an unusual move. So the uh, the most common move here, not the only one certainly, but the most common move is e5. And this can get into all kinds of incredibly deep theoretical variations where white's trying to attack over on the uh, on the queen side, and black is going for for mate on the king side. It's a lot of fun, very interesting stuff. But at any rate, none of this happened in our game. My opponent played c6 which is really rather a passive interpretation. So I, I don't think that this is going to really pose too many serious problems for white. It's solid. I mean, it's not it's not losing or anything, but it's, um, you know, it really gives white a free hand. So I, I, I don't, don't really like it and wouldn't recommend it. Okay, I castled. He played knight a6, bishop e3, knight c7. And here I think if, if white just plays h3, he'd have a slight advantage. So that way we don't have to worry about any of this knight to g4 stuff or, or bishop to g4. You know, bishop to g4 is also an important sort of idea for black. Um, you know, it's not necessarily one, a standard goal for black, but it's something that, that does come up in a number of variations with the idea of exchanging, or at least being willing to exchange on f3. And then after e5, or maybe c5, depending on what uh, what black decides, in that way, he'll try to get a good grip on the dark squares. So since the bishop on, on c8 doesn't really fit into that kind of plan, then it's not such a bad thing for him to exchange it off and then put pawns on the uh, on either c5 or e5, maybe in some case both, but, but not likely, probably, probably just one or the other. And um, so that way, black gets rid of a piece that doesn't help in that respect while exchanging off one of the pieces that I have that can fight for it. So I, I'm sure white still has an edge there, but it's just another way to play. So h3 would be a useful prophylactic move. All right, well, I played queen to d2, and I wasn't especially concerned. So uh, he played knight to g4, which attempts to, to, to punish me for not playing h3. But it seemed to me that after bishop g5, knight e6, and bishop to h4, everything was fine. The knight on g4, this, this critter really can't stick around here. I mean, it's going to be kicked away at some point. And um, it, it wasn't really clear that he had gained anything out of uh, chasing my bishop from e3 to h4. Black could play bishop to h6, but again, I simply move my queen, and it's just a series of one movers on his part without any real improvement in his position. So all the things that he pushes out there are just going to get pushed back. Okay, now he played c5. And here white has a few options. Um, one simple way to play this position is just with d5. But I thought, I'll just go for a Maroxy bind setup. So I played d takes c5, knight takes c5. And here I have kind of an interesting choice. One, one kind of clever way to play is to sack the pawn. Not sure that this is best, but it's interesting. So b4, of course, if the knight retreats, then black is in, you know, just as a very poor position. So bishop takes c3 would be the only principled response. Queen takes c3, and then knight takes e4. After queen, ta uh, queen to d4, certainly white has very good compensation. So I still have a space advantage. I've got the bishop pair. 
he has some dark sword weaknesses on his king side. His knights are a bit uh, a bit clumsy, really. Um, I don't know if they're I don't think they're really in any danger of being lost, but their their position is kind of unstable. I mean, if the knight from g g4 goes back to f6, then this one, the knight on e4, would be again very clumsy. I mean. I could simply attack it with bishop to d3, and then if he plays bishop f5, I'll play rook f to e1. And that knight is in trouble there. If he plays the uh, the other knight back to, to f6, so let's get rid of all of this stuff here. If he brings this knight back to f6, well, then this knight is going to have to go back to h6. And if I can keep him off of f5 as well, I think I'm in good shape. And also, maybe I can just play bishop takes f6, mess up his pawns, probably regain the d-pawn. So, at any rate, white has, I think, adequate compensation. Not more, but adequate compensation. Instead, though, I, I played knight to d4. This was very simply part of my plan. And um, now I'm just going to kick his knight away and just enjoy this, this Moroxy bind setup. So I've got pawns on c4 against his pawn on d6. And this means that I've got a nice space advantage, clearly, in the center. And it's very difficult for black to uh, to alleviate this pressure. Uh, black's typical ideas, well, black has, let's say, three ideas. So one, um, well, okay, two of them have to do with one idea. And, and that idea is to try to break down one of these two pawns. So either the C pawn or the E pawn, or both. So one plan is to go for, eventually, D5. Okay, obviously, you know, you can't play E6 here because the queen's hanging. So we're, we're talking about long-range plans here. So that would be one one type of idea. And the other, whoops, get rid of all this stuff here. The other idea would be to play for B5. So A6, rook to, whoops, rook to B8, bishop D7, B5, and so on. And in either case, if black can, can kind of crack up this, this Moroxy bind structure, then he'll have excellent chances. So white is typically going to try and restrain black and not allow him to, to get either of those breaks in safely. The third idea is for black to basically just sit on the position and try to make sure that his grip over the dark squares, like c5 and d4 and e5 and this long diagonal in general, oops, make that the same color, oops, that all of these remain kind of steadfast and, and in, black's, um, in black's corner. And he can continue with moves like a5 and maybe queen to b6, sometimes queen to b4, trying to, to cement this. So that's the third plan. So two plans involve trying to break down the bind. The third plan is essentially to ignore the bind and work around it. All right, well, in this position, my opponent decided to simply retreat the knight, which makes sense. It was a little bit loose over there on f6. Uh, actually, let me get rid of all of these, these colors here. Okay, so knight f6 is what was played, and I played f3. All right, so I'm keeping, again, all of his guys off of g4, and of course I'm protecting my pawn on e4, which he was threatening too. Um, okay, so now he played rook to e8, and here maybe I should play b4, just tick him straight away. So I, I probably pr played a little bit routinely here. Instead I played rook f to d1, and here maybe black should play a5, or at least he, if, if, he wants to, uh, if he wants to choose that plan, now would be as good a moment as any to, to, to do it, because, again, he gives me a second chance for b4. So I think both of us, well, he was, he, he does play it in a couple of moves, so in his case, I'm not sure what his excuse was. Uh, in my case, I thought that a5 would be just delightful, because I felt that I could always eventually play for b4 anyway, but by his playing a5, it gives me the... Um, the b5 square as a pretty much permanent outpost. So I thought, okay, I'll put one knight on, on b5, the other knight will go to d5, and I thought I should be very happy about this. And something like this is, in fact, what happens. So in this position, I think white just has a nice edge. Okay, he played bishop to d7. I continued with all the, uh, the routine moves here, rook a to c1. Now he played a5. Okay, I played b3 played bishop to c6. All right, so the idea of bishop to c6 is that it's just a clearance move. So it's not that he's going to support the d5 pawn break, or at least not in the foreseeable future, 
but rather he wants to maybe play knight f to d7, and then put the knight on e5, and again, just kind of sit there and ask me what I'm going to do. All right, well, I start off with bishop to f2. There's not really anything for my, knight, for my bishop to do on that diagonal anymore. While there could be some lines where I want to shore up the central dark squares and maybe poke an eye at the, uh, the knight on c5. All right, so we played knight f to d7, and now I played knight to d5. Okay, now here, for some reason, he changed, or, well, I don't know that he changed his mind. Maybe his plan was always to do what he did next move, but instead of playing knight to uh, f8, which is what he did, you know, he could have tried knight to, uh, to e5 instead. And then, you know, the question is, or one question is, well, can I play f4 anytime soon? I can't play it right away, maybe because if knight takes e4, but at some point, this may be something that I, I can just play. So I, I just have to build up, maybe play something like queen to c2, and then maybe queen f4. Or uh, queen to c2, knight to b5, and so on. So what he decided to play instead was knight to f8, and now I played knight to b5. All right, so the threat, of course, is to just win the exchange with this fork. Though actually, it's it's not really... Let me think, am I threatening this? Yeah, I am threatening it. Um, maybe not that way. Maybe I should use the other knight. I'm not sure. So anyway, if he takes, I can take the rook on e8. And if he takes my knight on e8, then I can take his bishop. And if he tries treating his bishop, I can take on g7. So my knight won't get trapped in there. It won't be a, a situation where I get two pieces for a rook. Uh, let me go ahead and just demonstrate that. So you don't have to try to follow all these arrows. Um, all right, so white to move, I can just play this. So I win the exchange, and even if he plays bishop takes, knight takes, the point is that, okay, obviously if he takes this, I can recapture and I'm up the exchange, meaning I'm up a rook for a minor piece. While if he retreats his bishop somewhere, I have knight takes g7. Okay, just winning easily here. Actually, winning, winning a full rook now, but that's kind of incidental to the variation. Okay, so after knight to b5, he probably should have just sat on the position, maybe played something like rook to c8. So this, I think, would have been a better choice. Um, now here I would probably play, well, okay, I have to be a little careful, because I mean, I'd like to play queen c2, generally speaking, with the idea of playing a3. See, I need my queen to protect the, the b pawn, and then playing b4, kicking him out, and so on. And also, with my queen on c2, there's the potential threat of bishop takes c5, followed by knight f6 check, and rook takes d8. So again, let me just demonstrate that. All right, so it's it's not clear that this is actually any good for me, frankly, because um, while I'm gaining a queen for a rook and a pawn, now all of a sudden it's really, really difficult for me to make any progress in the position. In fact, he's kind of threatening to play bishop takes b5, so now we'll make it black's move arbitrarily takes, takes, and now if nothing else, you can just maybe play bishop to d4 check, and just sit, or even better, knight to e6, and then the knight goes to, to d4, and it'll be really, really difficult for me to try to win this. All right, so even if uh, even if that's not really good for me right away, that, that kind of idea is, is hanging over the position. All right, so lots of possibilities. The, the, the drawback maybe of playing queen c2 get rid of all that junk, is that maybe I have to be a little cautious about this battery here of the rook and the queen. So I don't see any way for black to exploit it right away. I mean, bishop takes b5, c takes b5, and there aren't any really meaningful discoveries with the knight. But that's at least the kind of thing that could be in the air. So I have to, again, be, be a little bit cautious. All right. Well, Instead of rook to c8, which I think, uh, as I said, would probably be a safer idea, he chose to play bishop takes b5. And on one level, this looks kind of reasonable, because the bishop was really kind of choking there while my knight was very well posted on b5, and he had to worry about these these fork threats. Uh, also, I guess I can mention one other idea. If, if he plays knight to knight f to e6, this probably isn't so bad either. I mean, again, maybe at some point he has to worry about f4, f5, but... Not right now. So here, too, I probably would play queen c2 and then go for a3 and b4. So that's that's probably what would happen in this setting. 
Okay, so anyway, play bishop takes b5, c takes b5. And here I think he should have played b6. Now this looks a little bit ugly because of the c6 hole, but it's not so easy for me to actually get something in there. I mean, at some point I like to put a rook there. Uh, of course, if I could put another a minor piece there, that would be even better, but it's, it's hard to see how that could really happen. So anyway, white's definitely better here, but this would have been a better, a better try. So instead he played knight f to e6, and now I made a good move. I played b6, and now my bishop is ready to go into b5. His knight's not as securely uh, anchored on c5 as it was. And also my pawn on b6 is uh, supporting a potential knight c7 at some point, too. Okay, not right away, because he's got it covered, but it's just another tactical possibility that's in the air at some point. All right, black played h6, just a little bit funny looking. Oh, okay, the idea, I think, is that um, if it's white's move here, maybe I have something like this. Bishop to b5. Rook eight, uh, f8, and then bishop to h4. And he can't play g5 here. Maybe he can play bishop... No, 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 what am I saying? Yeah, so I mean, there's no really good move. I mean, he can play f6, but then he's weakening himself on, on the a2, g8 diagonal. So um, h6 allows him to play g5 if I follow that variation. Okay, well, I, I did play bishop to b5, but here I, I, I came up with a, a kind of a cute, cute little two-step here. So I played queen to e2, which I think is a, a cute move. The idea, well, it doesn't really threaten anything, to be honest, but it, it sort of bluffs at this kind of idea. So bishop takes, knight takes, rook takes, pawn takes, and then you know, I could play knight c7, though that would just regain the exchange, or I could play knight f6 check. But the problem is that at the end of all of these captures, I've given up... Um, two rooks for queen, and with no real compensation. So it's it's one of these kind of pseudo-threats. And let me just say, as a practical matter, you should not underestimate the pseudo-threat. So it sounds kind of funny, but um, especially when your opponent's in time pressure, when you have these, these kind of vaguely threatening gestures, so even if it's not really a threat yet, it's the sort of thing that will make your opponents nervous, and they'll often overreact trying to deal with it. I mean, most of us are, as the, as the expression goes, afraid of ghosts in, in a chess context. So there's some, some th something that looks like it's a threat. We'll often just kind of uh, react to it just to make sure that it's, it's not, not there. Even if it's not really a threat, we want to make sure. So queen e2, I think, is a nice move from that standpoint. Now, uh, it also maybe does carry with it a real threat, or at least a threat to make the real threat, which is f4. Okay, so after f4, if I can play f5, well, then that bishop takes c5 uh, idea is just winning. Both because when I play knight f6 check, I haven't given up the exchange first on c5, and second because then I do have knight to c7. So there is a genuinely threatening idea behind queen e2. Okay, my opponent played rook to c8, and now we'll see the, uh, the cute point, so this little triangulation that I did here. So the queen is on d2, I put it on e2, and then I put it on e1, attacking the a5 pawn. And if he makes this return trip back to a8, well, then I do play f4 with a simply winning position. So um, black is in a really difficult position here. He played the move f5. All right, and this is, again, something that often happens, especially as your opponent's getting into time trouble. They'll often lash out after suffering in a passive position for a long time. This just loses right away. There's a few ways that I could have won. E takes f5, rook takes f5. And now here's a good place for you to stop the recording and look for a couple of ways for white to win. So see if you can find at least two. Okay, I, I trust you've, you've uh, stopped it and tried to, to find at least uh, one or two ways to win this. There's probably more, but at least two. And um, so the, the best way, which I didn't choose, my way was... You know, it's certainly good enough, but wasn't the absolute best. So this is the best, I think. Queen takes e6, knight takes e6, rook c8. And you have this cute little fork at the end. Now, actually, I don't even know that this is really objectively the best. I, mean, I think they're both really, really strong. So the point is that here, although I'm only a pawn up at this microsecond, uh, I'm going to grab two more pawns. So knight d6, 
and then knight b7, and I'm now I'm three pawns up, and I'm threatening the a5 pawn, and my b pawn is really dangerous, and is probably going to cost black some serious material. So that would have won. Uh, what I did was quite quite good too. I just play bishop takes c5, and I'm threatening to play queen takes e6. Uh, if black tries rook to e5, that's no problem. I just play bishop to e3. It's completely winning. So he played knight takes c5, and now I just played knight e7 check. And the rest of this is just me consolidating. All right, so I'm up the exchange in two pawns here, and black has no real counterplay to speak of. So it's you know, I, I wouldn't say that I, I, I certainly didn't play with uh, computer perfection the rest of the way, but I wasn't trying to. I was just trying to ensure that uh, everything was nice and safe and well protected. Okay, so I double the rooks, so everyone's covered there. I could have taken on a5, probably no good reason not to, but again, just keeping everybody at home. You know, I don't need to be an exchange in three pawns up, so an exchange in two pawns up is plenty. So the, the main thing is just not to allow my opponent any counterplay. He played knight to e6, and now I improved my worst place piece, which is one of those positional um, rules of thumb that's often useful. So I played bishop to d3. Uh, of course, he can't take the rook on d6, because I have bishop takes g6, and then I take his queen. So he plays queen to f6. Now I played rook to e1. So um, this enables me to trade off his only rook, and again, the more trades the better, as long as, of course, I'm not making some big concession in the process. So, have a couple more moves, takes, takes, and now just g3. So this is, a, again, a good move. That way my king can get to a light square. I don't have to worry about his dark squared counterplay. So my king will be very comfortable on g2. Okay, now I've given up a pawn, so it might seem as if I've given some ground here, like I'm um, making negative progress here. But in fact, this isn't so, because after bishop to c4, Sorry, I'm just adjusting the mic here. Uh, after bishop to c4, now his king is in huge trouble because I'm threatening queen to d5 and queen to g8. And in fact, black has no really good response to this. Uh, he could play queen to c6, but then I play queen to d5, we trade queens, and then I'm going to win back that pawn and with interest too. But the most important thing is that he'll have absolutely no counterplay at that point, so it'll just be a very, very simple, purely technical task. Okay, so we play queen f6, queen d5, and now h5. So that way, uh, his last two moves, first of all, he gives himself the flight square on h6. Secondly, the queen is now protecting the bishop on, on uh, f8. So that way, when I play queen g8, this is guarded. Okay, so that's, that's the basic point. But, you know, none of this really matters very much. Whoops. In fact, I have a simple win. So queen, eight, queen to g8 queen to h8, and then I played h4. And my opponent resigned here because, well, obviously, after king f5, simply rook to f7 is winning. Uh, if you're a computer, you'll play queen to g8, and this gives mate in five moves, but okay. Any human, I think, is going to play rook to f7 unless there's some um, rather perverse propensity either to be um, sadistic or to look for computerish moves. So anyway, rook f7 is a completely decisive threat. Nothing he can do about it, and so after h4 check, my opponent resigned. All right, well now, here's a little quiz for you. And you might want to rewatch the entire recording to, to try to, to, to solve it. So there is one point in, in the game, and I didn't see it until many years later, and that was thanks to uh, the good old computer, um, where my opponent missed a, a, a win a win of, of, of serious material. So he missed it, I missed it, I missed it in analysis. Uh, none of the people that I ever showed the game to saw it. So it was only, I think, when I was um, showing a student once, and I think I was, I think I just had, had the engine on just to check to, to make sure that the stuff I was saying was right. Um, I'm not even sure if that was the context. But anyway, when I ran an engine over a decade later, all of a sudden I realized that I had missed something. So my, my challenge is for you guys to, to stop the recording here, just watch the program over again, and see if you can figure out, of course, not using an engine yourself, what I missed and what my opponent missed. Of course, so you have a hint. I mean, you, you know that there is something. I didn't know that at all at the time. So um, that's the challenge. All right.
Um, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to assume that everyone has done all this, and now I'll show you what was missed. And I'll, in fact, show an affiliated trap. All right, so here's where I missed something. Right here, the position after move 12. Okay, so right now everything is fine and normal. And I mentioned here that there was this pawn sack with b4. This is okay. What's not okay is what I, in fact, played. So knight to d4 is a blunder. All right, so again, here you have a chance to, to, to figure out what's wrong with knight to d4. See if you can do it if you haven't already. But again, don't use your engines. That's, that's, that's cheap. And there's no need, because I'm about to show you anyway. And the answer is, black could have played bishop takes d4. Now, this looks crazy. I mean, th it's so counterintuitive. But after queen takes d4, e5. And there's just a simple winning double attack. He's threatening e takes d4. He's threatening the uh, bishop on h4. And after simply bishop takes d8, e takes uh, d4. And there's another double attack. So again, he's hitting the, the knight, hitting the bishop, and I lose material. So I'm, I'm losing a piece for a pawn, I think, is the best I can do in any variation. So it's uh, really surprising, and again, it's just so counterintuitive. I mean, you don't think to give up this this dark squared bishop. I mean, it's such a strong piece. It's black's best piece in in, in the position, and uh, also, of course, it weakens his king side doing so. And then e e5. I mean, that's an even even more paradoxical idea. So it's very easy to miss. And I want to show you an opening trap, which really emphasizes, you know. So it wasn't just you know my opponent and I. Uh, both of whom were masters. Well, I was a master, and he had been a master, and was still a high expert. But even grandmasters have missed this idea. So let me show you a, a, a relatively well-known trap in the dragon, but one that, that has caught um, three or four grandmasters over the years. Okay, so we're almost there. Knight to d4. Now the right move here, or at least the most popular move here, is to play rook to a2, guarding the b pawn. Right, so it takes care of this threat along the long diagonal. And um, you know, it's it's a, a relatively balanced position. I mean, white maybe has a minuscule edge, though I doubt it. All right. Well, instead, a lot of players for white. Uh, this is shown up in at least 15 games in the database. And uh, this has been played. Knight to d4, which looks very, very natural. Black could take twice on d4, but white's got a small space advantage. The knight on d5 is very good. And if black plays e6 at some point, then he's weakening his d6, d6 pawn. However, knight to d4 is a blunder. And among the people who have played this, we can include Gadikamski, um, a grandmaster named Roman Slobodian, uh, the Dutch grandmaster Erwin Lamy, and most interestingly, the Bulgarian Grandmaster Vladimir Georgiev. Now, I'll explain why it's very interesting that Georgiev did this, and it's that, at least according to the database, he was on the winning side of this trap, so he had black in 1999 in this position, and won. And then, according to the database, he was on the white side of this in 2001, and, of course, lost. So, uh, I, I suspect pretty strongly it's a database error. If not, it's, you know, a remarkable example of well, I don't know, pick, pick your insulting word. I mean, it's incredible that he could fall for this after executing the trap himself two years before. So I, I really suspect that it's a database error. Um, Tivyakov, funny enough, has been on the black side of this twice. So once against uh, Kamsky when they were both very strong juniors. And uh, I forget who the second victim was. Uh, interestingly, um, in the game where Slobodian had white, he's playing Matthew Sadler, who... Unfortunately, he's retired from chess, but it was very, very strong. I mean, he was, I, I think, 2668 at the time of this game. And he didn't find it. So he uh, he, he didn't find the uh, the refutation of knight to d4. So uh, most of the games, black did find it. And the refutation is this. Bishop takes d4. And after bishop takes d4, e6. So not exactly the same trap as, as the one that, that I fell for, or should have fallen for. Well did fall for, but didn't uh, get punished for. But a similar idea, where bishop takes d4, as counterintuitive as it is, was in fact the uh, the correct and winning move. So the point here is that whichever square the knight retreats to, whether it goes to f4 or to e3, uh, e5 is going to be winning. So, oops. So let's 
play this way, e5, and that's the end of the bishop. So I could try bishop to a7, rook to b7, and white's out of uh, tricks. Because if he plays queen to d5, just knight takes a7. White has nothing. So, uh, you know, always have to be aware of these little stereotyped uh, ideas, you know, stereotyped thinking. It's very natural to think that black would never make such a capture on d4, either in this trap or in the position in my game. But nevertheless, um, you know, tactics always take precedence over these fine strategic abstractions, and my opponent missed a win. So, it was a game that I was proud of, and I think overall I played well, but... <laughs> This is uh, a pretty big hole in there. So, uh, you know, learn from both aspects. You know, be aware of, of these nice positional ideas, but, you know, always uh, keep in mind that chess is such a tactics-rich game that there are always ways, there are always possibilities like this where you can go astray or take advantage of your opponent's opportunities. So, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, thanks for tuning in. And again, let me remind everyone and invite everyone to, uh, to check out my blog. So that's at chessmind.powerblogs.com. I think you'll like it. Anyway, um, appreciate having you watch, and I'll see you next time. Good night.